designed a number of circuits so far and in every case what we have uh, realized is certain uh, small signal functionality or certain functionality in the small signal regime okay every function that we have realized is linear and we know that this linear behavior applies only in the uh, small signal limitation the small signal limit okay we are not worried about how large a signal we can actually apply while still respecting this limit okay now what happens in a real circuit is that let's say you take a common source amplifier or any other circuit if you apply a sinusoid to a linear system the output should consist of sinusoid at exactly the same frequency and no other frequency should uh, come out okay in fact a linear circuit a linear time invariant circuit cannot generate new frequencies right the output frequency will be exactly the same as the input frequency but a non linear circuit will generate harmonics if you have a single sinusoidal input and intermodulation that is if you have multiple sinusoids you will also get uh, output sinusoids whose frequencies are some more difference of input sinusoids okay so let's take the case of a single sinusoid if you have a 1 kilohertz input to a circuit you will have in general 1 kilohertz and all its harmonics 2 3 4 etc etc if you have a non linear circuit okay so in reality how you decide the size of signal you can apply is you will do the exact non linear an analysis or a measurement of the circuit you will apply a 1 kilohertz signal and you will look at the components that exist at other harmonics like 2 3 4 and so on okay and that the total strength of that the total uh, rms value of those harmonics that's characterized by what is known as the total harmonic distortion so if you have seen uh, amplifier specifications in particular if you have bought audio amplifiers or something it will show you tsd is something so that's what it means if you apply 1 kilohertz input there will be a number of audible harmonics up to 20 kilohertz and this tsd represents the percentage strength of those harmonics uh, compared to the fundamental okay so you will have some uh, specification in mind maybe the distortion has to be 1% of the actual signal or 0.1% and this again depends very much on the context in a high fidelity audio system it could be 0.01% or so or even lower okay so you have to measure or do the full non linear analysis of the circuit find out how much the harmonics are and you say that when the and in general uh, the strength of the harmonics always increases as you increase the uh, input signal okay in fact they increase faster than the input signal that is if you double the input signal in most cases the second harmonic tends to be four times and third harmonic tends to be eight times and so on okay this is because of uh, the power law right the second harmonic is generated by a square nonlinearity so 2 square is 4 uh, third harmonic is generated by a cubic nonlinearity so if you the input goes up from 1 volt to 2 volt this will go from something times 1 cube to something times 2 cube it goes up by 8 times so you will always find a signal that is large enough where uh, you will always find some signal amplitude for which the strength of the harmonics is so large that the circuit is useless for that particular application okay so really you specify the size of the signal by measuring the harmonic strength and specifying the harmonic strength to be Uh, at most some value okay now this is okay for uh, simulation and measurement but this is not something we can do by hand okay this analysis of uh, this type of non linear analysis it becomes too painful so what we uh, do is evaluate some crude limits for the signal okay so we know that the transistor has to be in uh, has to be on first of all and it has to be in saturation region right in all our circuits that's the idea because we want to maximize the gm and minimize the gds so we have to have uh, the transistor operating in saturation region so what we'll do is we'll look at the size of the signal that takes it out of this desired region okay it can either cut off or it could go into triode region so we'll evaluate these limits and specify that as the uh, size of the signal that you can apply okay and these are known as swing limits now these are still useful the main value of this is that although this is not the actual signal you can apply because if you do apply signals of this amplitude you will find that the harmonics will be quite large okay because we cannot evaluate the harmonics conveniently we use this as a proxy for how much signal you can apply it still has value because so let's say you have some signal i mean some uh, circuit 
for which you cannot apply as large a signal as you want. Okay. Now, you increase these uh, crude limits of the circuit by changing the operating point or making some modification to the circuit. You will find that even while uh, using the exact measure using the harmonics, you can apply a larger signal. Okay. So, it will still be useful while the numbers may not mean much. If you say that the swing limit of some circuit is plus 1 volt, you may not be able to apply 1 volt sinusoid and have very small harmonics. Okay. But what is true uh, by and large is that let us say you have some circuit whose limit is 1 volt and another circuit whose limit is 2 volts or the same circuit with some modification and its limit is 2 volts. You can apply a larger signal to this than to that one. Okay. So, it is still useful as a design aid. Okay. So, that is what we will do now and this principle is quite uh, general and this will apply to any circuits. Of course, I will take some particular circuit as an example. I will start with the common source amplifier. Okay. have more than one transistor. This can go into either cut off or triode region. Okay. There is some signal value for which it will go into cut off, some other signal value for which it will go into triode region. Obviously, any signal that you apply must lie within these limits. Okay. We will first look at single transistor circuits, but exactly the same will apply for multiple transistor circuits also. What you do is you evaluate uh, again the limits one by one, assuming that all other none of the other transistors enters the limit. You evaluate the limit for this transistor and that transistor and that transistor and there will be the worst case. Okay. So, if one of them limits you to this range and another one to that range, you will finally be able to have, well, you will be finally left with only that much. Okay. So, that is also quite easy. Is this fine? Is the concept of swing limit okay? It is basically a measure of how large a signal you can apply to the circuit. After circuits after all are non-linear. We need non-linear circuits for amplification, but the functions that we realize are linear. Okay. So, there is some signal limit for which this uh, linearity assumption breaks down completely and those are these swing limits. So, let me take the common source amplifier and just for simplicity, I will use the very first circuit, the one with constant VGS bias, although this is not a great circuit. That part does not matter. The principle for finding swing limits can be illustrated with any circuit. Okay. We will of course, assume that C 1 and C 2 are very large and V i is of a signal frequency where these uh, capacitors do behave like short circuits or if you assume infinitely large capacitors that is true for any signal frequency. Okay. So, essentially we will assume that the capacitors are short circuits in all our calculations. Okay. I mean short circuits in the incremental sense. If you look at the total voltage, they will have some constant voltage drop across them. But again for simplicity let me take R s to be 0, otherwise I will get V i times R 1 parallel R 2 divided by R s plus R 1 parallel R 2 in all our expressions. So, let me take R s also to be 0. Okay.
now let me list out the quantities the quiescent value of vgs what is that very times r2 by r1 plus r2 you can find out whatever it is you can find out in the circuit so i'll call it vgs q and in this particular case it is vdd times r2 by r1 plus r2 okay and what is the quiescent drain source voltage yeah so there is some bias current let's say id quiescent there is some uh, bias current flowing in the transistor the quiescent value of id is by definition idq quiescent value of ID, vds is okay so you can calculate it regardless of what method of biasing you use you do know the quiescent values of uh, vgs vds and id obviously right so this is the operating point what about the increments what is the incremental gate source voltage what is the incremental gate source voltage vi vi i mean the capacitor is a short circuit all of vi appears here so the incremental vgs is vi in this case if you do have non zero value of rs you will have some voltage division that also you can find okay there is nothing uh, difficult about it except that you get a slightly more messy expression what is the quiescent while sorry what's the incremental drain current gm vi okay and what is the incremental drain source voltage what is that yeah it's just so i didn't write down the incremental equivalent but you can do that okay so if you are confused what you can do is you can take this first write the dc equivalent by open circuiting all capacitors then you will find the operating points then you write the incremental equivalent by replacing the transistor with its linear equivalent as well as uh, shorting all the fixed sources and also shorting the capacitors because they are very large and small so you can find the incremental quantities from the incremental equivalent circuit and the operating point quantities from the operating point equivalent circuit okay so you will you know that this uh, quiescent drain voltage which is also the quiescent drain source voltage is minus gm rd parallel rl times v i okay so what is the total gate source voltage when the signal is present just some in fact that's the idea right in reality this itself is an approximation because we are using a linear approximation to find the increments but the whole point was uh, we introduced incremental analysis saying if once you do the operating point analysis for uh, deviations around the operating point you can simply sum the operating point plus the increment which is calculated using the linear circuit okay so the total quantities vgs total will be the quiescent value of vgs plus vi and then the th total drain source voltage would be quiescent value of uh, vds minus gm rds sorry rd parallel rl times vi by the way i have omitted the output conductance of the transistor in this example but if it is there that will also appear in parallel with the load that's all and the total drain current is idq plus gm vi okay 
Is this fine? What is the condition for the transistor to not go into triode region or just enter triode region? VDS has to be greater than VGS minus VT. When VDS becomes equal to VGS minus VT, it is on the verge of triode region. Okay? So, please find the value of VI for which the transistor just enters triode region. Okay? Of course, these things have to be done based on the total quantities. It is the total voltage across the transistor that counts, not the operating point by itself or the incremental value by itself. Okay? So, please find out when the total VDS, the value of VI at which the total VDS just becomes equal to total VGS minus the threshold voltage. So, the transistor enters triode region or other uh, for the transistor to be in saturation the total VDS has to be greater than or equal to the total VGS minus the threshold voltage okay and we know that the total VDS is the quiescent value plus sorry minus gm R d parallel R l, which is basically the gain. If I call A v the voltage gain, it is that times V i, this should be greater than the quiescent V g s plus V i minus V t. Okay? So, what does this tell you? V i has to be less than or equal to So, this gives you the upper limit for V i and it does make sense because as V i becomes positive starting from 0, the gate voltage increases that increases the drain current. Okay? So, as the drain current which is going into the drain increases, this voltage drops. Okay? So, it will tend to go towards the triode region. right? So, when the drain voltage goes down and the gate voltage goes up, that is when it tends to move towards the triode region. right? The for it to be in saturation, the drain uh, has to be above a certain value. Okay, drain can go below the gate, but not by more than one threshold voltage. So the drain voltage falls by too much, it goes into triode region. Gate voltage is going up. Now, as the gate voltage goes up, the current in the transistor increases. That is pulled out of this node, right? This node decreases. And in fact, we have done this. We know that from the small signal, we know from small signal calculations that we get minus gm R d parallel R l V i here. But why does that happen? That is because this voltage is increasing. So, that voltage falls from the quiescent value, okay? is not it? So, that is why the incremental gain is negative. Okay? As V i increases, the drain voltage falls. That is the meaning of the incremental uh, gain being negative. That is all. And also, if the gate voltage moves up by one step, one unit, one millivolt, the drain voltage falls down by gm times rd parallel rl millivolt so that means it has gain gm times rd parallel rl could be a number that's much more than one so if the gate moves slightly the drain moves a lot okay and that's the reason to use an amplifier first of all okay so what the incremental picture represents are just the changes so here the gain is negative what it really means is it falls from the quiescent value okay so this saturation, uh, the triode region limit, it imposes an upper limit on V i. Okay? Also, does this expression make sense? Why do we have 1 plus gm R d parallel R l in the denominator? Why is that? Okay, we get any algebraic expression, but it is always better to make sense out of that. Yeah. So, what you are looking at is, what you are comparing are the drain and the gate voltages. right? 
the drain voltage has to be above the gate voltage minus 1 VT. Okay. Now, as the input changes just like I told you just now that if the gate voltage changes by 1 millivolt, the drain voltage falls by G m times R d parallel R l millivolts okay. and the separation between them is falling by 1 plus G m times R d parallel R l units. Okay. So, that is why it appears in the denominator. Okay. So, if this goes down a little that falls down by that much. So, the distance is uh, becoming smaller by the sum of the two. Okay. And what is this quantity here? V d s quiescent minus V g s quiescent, what is that? What is it? It is the quiescent drain gate voltage. It basically tells you how far the drain is above the gate in quiescent condition. So, if the drain is very high above the gate in quiescent condition, it has a long way to fall. Okay. So, you will have a very high swing limit, but if let us say the drain was biased at the same voltage as the gate, then it has very little room to fall. Okay. This plus V t comes because the drain can go below the gate, but by just 1 V t. Okay. So, that is why you have that plus V t and we will uh, for our uh, purposes V t is a positive number. So, the drain can fall below the gate. Okay. So, what do you have to do for a large swing limit? You want a large positive swing limit. So, far everything that we did, we chose the operating point based on the G m of the transistor right? and then uh, as long as the transistor was biased in saturation, we did not care exactly how much the drain source voltage was, but you do see that it is an important thing. So, if you want a large swing limit, what do you have to do? You have to bias the drain far above the gate. Okay. So, you have to have enough room for the signal to fall. So, the operating point now you can see there is also uh, these things also impose a constraint on the operating point. Okay. Is this fine? And also, uh, I told you that you can take any signal picture, combine it with any bias picture. The difference, I mean, this could be one of the differences. You combine, let us say, one type of biasing for common source amplifier, another type of biasing, then you could compare the swing limits as well. That is yet another parameter that could be of interest. Okay. Is this fine? So, that is that sets one of the limits. Of course, we want the transistor also to be on. So, that means that the transistor should not cut off. Okay. So, how do you find out when the transistor cuts off? Huh? V g s equal to V t or the drain current equal to 0. Is that fine? So, So, at this point it just cuts off, is this correct? In fact, for it to not cut off, I should say that V a has to be greater than minus V g s q minus V t. Okay, I took the minus out just to explicitly show that it is a negative voltage. right? The quiescent V g s will be more than V t, otherwise the transistor would not be biased in the first place. Okay. This I think, did I define the term gate overdrive? Overdrive. So, this V g s minus V t, V g s q minus V t, it is known as the gate overdrive. That is basically, that tells you how much the MOS, tra MOS transistor is overdriven. When you make V g s equal to V t, the MOS transistor just turns on. Okay. Anything beyond that is considered as an overdrive, that is just another terminology. So, this tells you that V i has to be greater than minus of V g s q minus V t okay. and this sets a negative limit. Is this okay? Alternatively, we could also say that the total drain current which is the quiescent current plus G m V i, this is greater than 0. What is the limit we get as a result of this? Minus i d by G m. Are these two the same? They are? 
what is the expression for gm in terms of id and vgs minus vt we had some expression right what was that ah so gm one of the expressions for gm is by the way this is quiescent voltage two times id q by vgs q minus vt that's the gm evaluated at the operating point so what do we get if we substitute that in there Ah, uh, minus VGS Q minus VT divided by two. What happened? Yeah. What is that? Why? I mean, I said uh, cut off is when current goes to zero. Evaluate that, or VGS becoming equal to threshold. These two give different answers. Which is correct? Huh? No, it is in saturation. This is in saturation region, and we calculate the GM at the operating point, right? That's the whole idea behind small signal analysis. We evaluate the small signal parameters at the operating point. Why is there this inconsistency? What's happening here? I evaluated presumably the same thing from two different methods, and I get two different answers. So one or both are wrong, or at least there has to be some excuse for this. Which where is linearization used here? No, but it's the same thing that we are uh, calculating, right? We said cut off. Yeah. Which one? Yeah, it is in saturation region. Yeah. No, why? No. I will. I assume that the transistor is in saturation region. That's all. Okay. Cut off has nothing to do with triode. You can have a very large VDS and still cut off if you have VGS to be too small. Okay, and no mystery here. This, uh, like I said, GM is not constant. So if you plot ID versus VGS of the MOS transistor, it will have some threshold voltage, and after that. it will do that okay and we bias it at some point so let's say we bias it here okay now while calculating the incremental drain current i said the incremental drain current is gm times vi okay i have already used the small signal linear model there right to say that the when i apply vi there is some change in the drain current to find out how much change there is i use this expression which corresponds to the small signal linear model so i already used the linear model so in this picture what is the model that i am using so as vgs changes the drain current changes and this the what i have shown in the red curve is the exact characteristic of the mos transistor but if i use that expression gm vi what am i really doing i am uh, using the straight line which is the tangent to this curve at the operating point okay so this expression this is idq this is vgsq okay so this expression corresponds to the quiescent current plus gm times the incremental voltage okay and the incremental voltage is nothing but vgs minus the quiescent value right so clearly you can see that the red curve reaches zero somewhere here whereas the blue one reaches zero there 
and it is the property of the parabola that if you draw a tangent it will reach 0 exactly halfway to that ok that is this distance will be twice that distance ok. So, that explains the inconsistency. So, but which is the one that we should use? Now, the thing is both these are like I said crude limits, you never take the transistor all the way to cut off ok, the things will be so nonlinear that uh, you will have very high harmonic content if you do that ok. So, both of these are uh, crude limits and it turns out that this is what we use most of the time, there are a couple of reasons for it ok, for the MOS transistor you could have used either one, but uh, first of all there are other devices like the bipolar junction transistor where there is no concept of a threshold voltage. In case of MOS transistor at least according to our model if uh, VGS is smaller than VT the drain current goes to 0 ok, the drain current of a bipolar transistor never goes to 0 like that because it has an exponential which never goes to 0 that way ok, whereas this other one is uh, other one can be conveniently evaluated ok. So, to have the same treatment for both MOS and bipolar we do use the criterion based on the drain current and not the gate source voltage ok. And as far as the MOS is concerned this gives you a slightly conservative answer, we know what answer it gives, it always gives you half the limit that you would have got from using the other limit ok. So, we know what we are doing, we know that it gives a different answer and we know how much it is different by, but like I said the main value of evaluating swing limits is to modify the circuit. So, it is not that the V i value that we get from this that is the voltage that we can apply. If we have two circuits uh, like for one circuit this number is minus 1 volt, for the other circuit it is minus 0.25 volts, we know that we can apply larger signal to the first circuit that is the idea ok. So, we do use the criterion based on the linearized drain current because exactly the same thing can be used for the bipolar transistor whereas, this one is very specific to the MOS transistor, we would rather use the same kind of uh, methodology for both MOS and bipolar. So, we usually we always use the criterion based on the drain current ok, this is fine. Any questions? We know why it is different, it is simply that one is a parabola the other is a straight line, this parabola may seem like an exact thing, but both of these are crude limits anyhow ok, it is just a measure of how large a signal you could apply. So, we use the criterion based on a drain current ok. Sir, yeah, that will be the one based on. I mean, this increment is going to be smaller than this, right? For sure. No, no, no. Oh, the that's right. So that means that uh, the signal value has to be between the two limits. Okay. Ah. Uh, no, that is. Yeah, you are saying what happens if you have want to apply a sinusoid, then yeah the smaller of the two will limit it, but it may not be a sinusoid or you may just want to find out what the limits are, so that you want to modify one of them and so on ok. So, that we will see with an example. So, let us say let me put down some numerical values. Please evaluate the swing limits for this case with R s equal to 0 and our usual MOS transistor. Okay. What I mean by swing limits is you basically have to find V i the range over which V i can vary while keeping the transistor out of either triode or cutoff regions. Okay. So, one limit will come from cutoff, the other limit will come from triode. Very easy to evaluate the equation conditions. So, this is 3 volts and 
if it is in saturation it should be carrying 200 micro amperes. So, this comes out to be 4 volts and it will be in saturation. Okay. So, what are the limits you get? You can see that the drain is biased 1 volt above the gate. So, the drain can fall down by roughly 2 volts. Okay. I do not think I need to work this out because I showed the exact expressions. If you have difficulty, you contact me afterwards. So, V i has to be smaller than 2 by 11 volts, which is about 180 millivolts or so, and this limit is because of the transistor entering triode region. On the other side, what is the limit? Minus 1 volt, okay, and this is because of cutoff, okay. What he was referring to earlier was that if V i happens to be a sinusoid, what is the amplitude, largest amplitude of the sinusoid that you can have? Obviously, 2 by 11 volts. Okay. So, the swing limits are not symmetrical, but a sinusoid is. So, if the upper half of the sinusoid is distorted, that still means distortion. So, if you have a symmetric signal, obviously, the smaller of the two limits will count. Okay. So, one of the design criteria may be to make this to choose the operating point so that this comes out symmetrically. Okay. And here you can see uh, you can change the value of let us say the supply voltage while keeping the quiescent V g s the same. So, that means functionality nothing has changed except the supply voltage and you will have to change the value R 1 right. You can as an exercise try out change V t d and R 1 such that the swing limits are symmetric. Okay. So, you can try this, you can try it out later. Now, for any circuit this is exactly what you do. Okay. For every transistor you evaluate the total V g s, total V d s and total I d. Okay. And Uh, calculate the total quantities and for hand analysis we always do it as the sum of quiescent which comes from the analysis of the nonlinear circuit plus a small signal this part comes from small signal linear equivalent the incremental equivalent circuit okay and for the triode limit you use vds total greater than or equal to vds total minus sorry V g s total minus V t or sometimes it may be convenient to rewrite this as the total V d in which case you have to calculate the total quantities at the drain and gate not with respect to source, but with respect to ground that is also easy the total V g minus V t and the cutoff as I said by convention we always evaluate using this limit. So, for cutoff we use greater than 0. Okay. Now, all these will be expressed in terms of V i. Okay. And you get the swing limits also in terms of V i. Now, sometimes you may be asked for the output limits. Okay. So, then you calculate it in terms of the output voltage that is all. Is this fine? And if you have a multiple transistor circuit, you do this for every transistor, you get a set of limits. So, let us say or rather it is rather much easier to show it in pictures. 
let us say the limit for V i is some level. So, let us say this is 0 volts and so the allowable level is somewhere here okay. and because of M 2 it is somewhere there and because of M 3 it is somewhere there and so on. So, obviously, the total limit would be that much right you get the idea. If I write it in terms of inequalities, I have to say this is greater than that, that is greater than this and all that. The picture tells you what is going on, right. So, okay. Any questions about the swing limit? I will not show it with every circuit, but you have to be able to do this for every circuit including control sources and so on. But the principle is exactly the same because you know how to evaluate the operating point quantities, that is just the biasing picture and the incremental quantities for every control source also you know. So, you simply add up the incremental quantities from the linear small signal equivalent circuit to the operating point values to get the total and we just use this algorithm that is all. Okay. If you have multiple transistors the limits can come from uh, various things. Okay. So, the upper limit could be because of some transistor reaching uh, triode region. In this case the upper limit was because of the transistor reaching triode region, the lower limit was because of the same transistor going into cutoff, but it could be something else. It could be because of some other transistor going into triode region or cutoff or who knows what. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Why not? I mean you can have uh, asymmetric uh, signals which have 0 average right that is quite easy. I mean for instance if you had to fit a signal to this which had DC as 0 average that is quite easy right. So, I just had to have uh, let us see not like this, but uh, I had to have something like that, right. So, if, uh, if I have duty cycle uh, the right ratio I can always have it. So, all I have to do is to the question was I mean can I have a signal with different positive and negative peaks and still have 0 average and yeah I have to make sure that the positive and negative areas are the same. Okay. So, like I said this starts from 3 volts maybe I will show it with the picture. gate voltage the quiescent value is 3 volts and if you apply a sinusoid the gate voltage will go up and fall down below the quiescent value and so on. And what will the drain voltage do? The drain falls like that okay, and rises above etcetera. So, that is what it does, it is a sinusoid, I did not draw it very well. And if the input amplitude is 2 by 11 volts, how much will be that voltage? What is that voltage? 1 volt, right? It is the threshold voltage, the drain has fallen below the gate by 1 threshold, that is why it has entered triode region. Okay. That is what we are looking for, right? For a smaller amplitude, this negative peak of uh, the drain voltage will be also higher. So, the separation will be smaller. So, now if you increase this any further, you can do this. The linear model says the voltage has to go that way, but actually what will happen is the it will distort quite a bit and it will do something like that. Okay. So, that we consider as the limit. Similarly, on the negative side, we say that if it goes to 2 volts that is an increment of minus 1 the drain goes to uh, sorry the transistor goes to cut off. Okay. So, uh, just quickly what is the drain voltage when the transistor goes to cut off when V i is minus 1 volt? Huh? How much? The transistor goes to cut off. Okay, forget the approximate criteria and so on. I will just say that the transistor goes to cut off. What is the drain voltage? Why? No current where? 
yeah, in the transistor, but in the resistor. That is not correct, it is a commonly made mistake, but in quiescent condition there is 200 microamperes here and 200 microamperes there, right. What happens as the gate voltage is reduced? The current here reduces, okay. the voltage here rises, so the current in R d also reduces, but the current in R l increases, so some current is going that way, okay. it has to be, is not it, otherwise how could the output voltage increase? The output voltage quiescent value is 0 and it is increasing right, if it is behaving like an amplifier and if the capacitors are short. So, if the voltage is increasing there has to be current flowing there. So, the cutoff is when this current is 0, but that means that all of the current in R d is flowing through R l. So, please evaluate the drain voltage when that happens ok. It is quite easy to do if you understand the incremental stuff properly, but that voltage is if R l was infinity if this was an open circuit that is correct when this is 0 that is also 0 and it goes to V d d, but uh, that is not the case when R l is finite ok. No, no the capacitors are short and the input is always such that the capacitors are short right, input is at a frequency when the capacitors are short. So, please evaluate the transistor ok.